Excellencies, colleagues, friends and members of the society and dear panelists, welcome to this opening discussion how international law works in times of crisis. Sorry, now you can hear me, I suppose. <laughs> it surely does not need much to remark that we have plenty of crises, especially in, the, in, the Europe, in, in Europe in the moment, starting with the refugees, um, Ukraine, Brexit, terrorism, and ongoing, of course, the environment worldwide, globally. All those issues are governed one way or the other by international law. And the question is how international law works to deal with them. Let me start with the definition of crisis by the Oxford English Dictionary, although both panelists will probably follow their own one. It's defined as a times of difficulty, insecurity and suspense, either politics or commerce, and then of course you have other definitions of crisis concerning health, but we leave this out here. The word derives from ancient Greek, crisis, meaning decision, and that obviously, it's obvious that decisions are needed in times of crisis. They have to be taken one way or the other. We do not want to talk about whether international law works in times of crisis, but how. Also, we do not want to discuss whether international law itself is in crisis. Also, of course, this question is also connected um, to the question of how it works, because law which does not work as it is supposed to do will at one point stop to function. But I think as international lawyers, we all agree that international law has many ways of becoming effective and has many ways to matter um, to the relevant actors. Maybe this is also issue specific, issue area specific. Maybe it matters in a different way in one issue area than in the other. But all those are open questions which we hope to discuss. So let me quickly introduce the panelists, although all are probably known to you. Let me have one remark. Catherine Redwell is um, unable to join us here for personal reasons, um, and we just knew about it, so we didn't have time to prepare differently. Um, we are very sorry that she's unable to join, um, but I'm sure we will have a lively discussion uh, with the two panelists we have. Now let me quickly say a word to myself. I'm a professor at the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland, and I'm currently a global professor of law at NYU for this fall, but I'm sitting here because I'm one of the vice presidents of ESIL. Now, let me turn to, I skipped Catherine, <laughs> let me turn to Judge Crawford, somebody I actually do not need to introduce, but I'll do so nevertheless shortly. He's an academic and practitioner in the best way, hmm? or was, well, you, I think you still are. Um, your books are still widely read and very influential, and you keep on writing, so, um, so um, um, I would still think you are one of the most influential scholars in the field of public international law. So he was elected judge um, to the, um, of the International Court of Justice in 2014 and took his seat at the court in February 15. From 1990 to 1992, um, Judge Crawford was Dean of the Sydney Law School. From 1992 to 2014, he was Professor of International Law at the University of Cambridge and Fellow at Jesus College. Um, he was formerly Director also of the Lauterbach Center of International Law, um, probably a center well known to you all, um, also in Cambridge. In 1985, um, Judge Crawford was elected an associate of the Institut de Droit International and then later became full member, but he was the youngest member elected ever in modern times. Now, he also served as a special rapporteur on state responsibility at the ILC from 97 to 2001 and was pro responsible for the production of the ILC draft statutes for, an, um, um, for, for well, certainly for their RCVA, and I think it's not exaggerated, we can call you Mr. RCVA because there's nobody else who has been so influential. Um, on state responsibility. And surely secondary norms are highly important in times of crisis. 
He was also responsible for the production of the ILC's draft statute for an international criminal court. Last but not least, let me mention that Judge Crawford is a lifelong member of ESL, and we are very proud and happy that you, um, you, 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 you somehow show your allegiance to the society in that way. Let me turn to Laurie Marzo, who works as a professor of international law at the University of Tartu since 2009. He is a graduate of the University of Tartu. He has done his LLM in Georgetown University and his doctorate at Humboldt University in Berlin. He has been a postdoctoral researcher at NYU and at Tokyo University. And you can see this, um, he's a truly globalized international lawyer in this way. Um, <laughs> He was the main organizer, and I'm proud to say that, um, and that was the most important event we ever had in Eastern Europe. He was the main organizer of the fourth research forum at the European, of the European Society of International Law in 2011 um, in Tartu. He's also the director of, Estonia, of the Estonian foreign policy, of a, for, or the, a, or the, foreign, the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute, which is a think tank in Tallinn, sorry. Um, um, in 2013, he was elected member of the Estonian Academy of Science, and he's currently the society's youngest member. He has published on the international legal status of the Baltic states, the history and theory of international law, and most importantly, recently, Russia's concept of international law, um, which came out a book um, called Russia's, Russia's Approaches to International Law uh, with OUP. Um, I'm also happy to say that he has been a board member of ESL since 2008 and always raised his voice for Eastern Europe and um, the importance of having the society in Eastern Europe. So uh, we are very happy to have you on this panel as well, Laurie. And um, before, um, uh, before giving the, the floor to the panelists, um, I would quickly like to inform you about how we proceed. So we will have a 10-minute statement um, of each of the panelists. Um, would have a discussion in between those um, then um, and open the last 15. Now we have more time since we are missing one panelist, probably 20 minutes um, to the questions and comments from the audience. So please note your questions, note your comments, and we are happy to have them later on. We will move from more general statements and of reflections on the theory and history and procedure um, to more specific crises later on. So may I give the word to Judge Crawford. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here again. I say again in relation to the society, not in relation to Latvia. It's wonderful to be here for the first time. And to see from the first panel that Latvia is being led by young people uh, at a time when leadership and good sense are much called for. If there were no international crises, most of us wouldn't be international lawyers. We go around bewailing crisis, at the same time trying to identify it and seeing it sometimes when it's not there. But we validate our calling as international lawyers significantly by reference to the international crises with which we may have been involved and about which we can or feel we can speak. I'm afraid that's true of me. I wouldn't be an international lawyer but for an international crisis. But the crisis was a long time ago, in 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. At that point of time, I was 14 and walking around a school playground. But it occurred to me that the world really was in a mess. And I had a premonition at full age of 14, which turns out to be an absolutely true, that there was a prospect of thermonuclear conflict, if not an outright thermonuclear war, at least the, the first use of nuclear weapons since the end of the Second World War. And it occurred to me that, though I wasn't yet a lawyer, there needed to be some, something that people could do, and could do from a place as remote as Adelaide, uh, to 
influence events of that sort which could affect so many people. I don't criticise Adelaide for being remote. Everywhere is remote from somewhere. And the people who live there don't regard it as remote. But my brother, who lives in Hong Kong, says that Adelaide is a good place to have come from. And he has a point. So that was it in my case. I was much struck later on when I realised I was teaching international law to students who weren't alive at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And in many cases had never heard of it. Of course, for students, the past is not a continuum. It's a given. And the, the, their, their view of the world is very much that the Cuban Missile Crisis was co-contemporary with, co-evil with Attila the Hun, the fall of Constantinople, and possibly other even more remote events. Um, so we define ourselves by reference to our own crises, and we see crises sometimes where they are not, but certainly also where they exist. Uh, Professor Van Aken very kindly said I was an academic and scholar. I try to be a scholar. I'm no longer an academic, uh, and I miss it. But it's a fact. I'm a judge and an arbitrator, and that's basically all I'm allowed to do. And you'll understand being a judge and an arbitrator, and in particular a judge on the international court with its gen general remit. I can't talk about modern crises. I can talk about the fall of Constantinople, <laughs> but I can't talk about more recent events, whether they occur in the uh, adjacent to the Black Sea or in the South China Sea or other seas. <laughs> you, you will know what I'm talking about, but I can't mention the words. <laughs> this has created a certain problem in terms of the discussion because Laurie is extremely adept. Coming from this part of the world, he's going to have to be adept at soliloquy for part of the time. So what I say is that every generation has its crises, and every generation defines itself in terms of the crises that it's had. And it would be possible to have a lengthy discussion on the crises of the period of 1814 to 15, for example, or 1814 to 1824 might be a more appropriate period. Uh, the status of Napoleon on Elba, the status of Napoleon during the Hundred Days, uh, his position vis-a-vis -vis his captors after Waterloo. All of these were crises. And it turns out if you look at them carefully, that they were crises which were resolved in part through the use of contemporary legal language. Some of it being used, of course, for the first time. Because part of the attraction and fascination and difficulty of our subject is that it tries to deal with events that have occurred for the first time using language which is sanctified by time. And that's a great tension in the field of international law, but part of its attraction in addition to the fact that it, you might get to deal with a crisis if you're lucky. Um, Isabel Hull has recently looked very carefully at the crises of the First World War and found out that there was much more legal about them than anyone had been prepared to concede. And I'm sure that's true about the crises of the 20s, the Locarno Pacts and so on, the crises of the 30s and of the 40s, and so on, until we become conscious that we too own crises and can talk about them with the authority of someone who was there on the day. Because I can't talk about contemporary, uh, I'm sorry, current crises, I can mention the crises of the period which influenced me to become an international lawyer. And they were the subject of an important American society uh, set of publications which asked effectively the same question as we were asked to this panel. How does international law work in time of crisis? 
not, not whether it works, because whether it works is something you, you don't know, more or less by definition. You only find out later, and then only in a controversy after the event, whether it worked. I suppose the crisis for which it didn't work was the crisis in which it provided no language with which to disagree. Someone said that a treaty was a disagreement reduced to writing. Um, a crisis is a disagreement reduced to the, the language of the disagreement. And the language of many disagreements is a language we're used to using when we talk about international relations. International relations scholars who profess to despise international law nonetheless use normative language drawn from international law all the time. They, they get very annoyed when you point that out to them. Uh, and some, sometimes I suppose they stop. But we should get worried when we have an international crisis in which the language is not, of international law is not used. Even if it is used in contentious, non-opposable, possibly counterproductive ways. Because we, in dealing with the problems of the world, we first have to reduce them to writing or to a sort of writing. We have to reduce them to a sort of dialogue. And the dialogue operates across time to produce outcomes which may or may not have been predictable at the time, may or may not have been influenced strongly by international law, but nonetheless international law was part of the fabric of those crises. The four that the American society chose for this study in the 1960s were the Cuban Missiles Crisis, of course, Hungary in 1956, the Congo, and the outbreak of peacekeeping, as you might call it, and Suez. And they were all events which at the time were indisputably regarded as crises. Most of our students would not be aware that three of those things occurred. They might be aware of the Cuban Missile Crisis because that's had a certain hold in international relations studies in the United States. And because the, the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis is still very much there. It's only been, and only in some ways, has been started to be dismantled recently. And can we say anything useful about how international law works in relation to crises such as the ones I've mentioned? Uh, not, to, not to say the more unmentionable crises which we're currently facing. The first thing which is obvious and which international lawyers have to face up to is that each of those crises is a crisis because of a conflict of power and a conflict of pretension by leading states or the leaders of leading states. And any analysis which ignores the element of power and power rivalry will obviously miss the point. But at the same time, international lawyers would say, I've got to use words when I talk to you. I've got to use words when I disagree with you. And international law provides, uh, as a minimum, the vocabulary of the words that are used in, that, in such cases. The vocabulary of collective self-defense, of preemptive action, of quarantine, which is a term deliberately taken from the law of Pacific blockade. And the eventual agreements often reached in an informal way, which lead to some resolution of the problem. The thesis of Abe Chase's book on the Cuban Missile Crisis, which has always struck me as essentially correct, is that given a president and an attorney general who were deeply conscious of the risks they were running. International law provided, not necessarily lawfully, but it's not always for international law to do things lawfully, curiously, it provided a, media, a, a via media, a way out of the crisis which could be adopted and which would not be said to 
conflict with the major security aims of both parties. And when we discovered later on what I had intuited in that Adelaide school playground, that the Soviet naval commander in the Caribbean had the authority to use nuclear weapons without recourse to Moscow, we realised that that mattered. When we find out, as we found out later on, that it was an international lawyer who suggested the hotline between Washington and Moscow, we should be grateful for our profession. It, it can't necessarily solve crises, but it can provide sometimes the means of their solution. And that realisation came about when Kennedy said, I want to speak to Khrushchev, and was told that he couldn't. So part of the language of international law is the language of communication and compromise. And one of the problems that we have with modern international law is that much of its language doesn't seem to allow for compromise, but really to set up positions in zero-sum ways. And part of the difficulty of trying to cope with, for example, the aftermath of cases of state responsibility is to realise that law, law rules OK, question mark, but only with the question mark. There's another category of crisis which international lawyers face which seems to me to create a crisis for international law in the way in which, in retrospect, some of the crises I've been talking about didn't do. Because people in dealing with these situations are deliberately abandoning international law for other means. There would have been, and there's a very good article in the American Journal on this, there would have been an international law of the Third Reich. It would have been the international law of the Vienna Award. And it wouldn't have been a very nice international law. But who said we went into the subject because it was nice? We went into it because it's a way of being part of and conceivably influencing crises. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a great feeling to, to be in the, on the same panel with Judge Crawford and, of course, Anne Banach. And I was a student in the Hague Academy of International Law when, when, when James was, uh, I believe, lecturing there the first time in 97. So that's a positive message to all younger members of the European society. Just work hard, and, and in the end, you can discuss with, with, with Judge Crawford. Um, um, we have two, two notions in the title of this conference that we, we think that the new notion here is, is the notion of crisis and, and we learned that it comes from the Greek crisis and, and then we can think what it exactly means in the context of international law. I think the answer, but, but the other notion is international law that we think we know about but, but actually I believe that this age-old tension between natural law and legal positivism schools, it, 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 it continues to our days and it shapes our expectations to, to international law. Because as a, le a legal positivist would take a relatively restricted view of international law. International law is only what states have explicitly agreed to. And then you have to some extent less expectations about what international law will accomplish. But if you, if, you, if you see international law in most UN declarations and, 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 uh, and uh, commitments that are perhaps semi-political or soft law, then of course you have bigger expectations to this. And then you think that international law must solve the food crisis and, uh, and, and, and all different uh, problems, poverty in the, in, in the world. Mm. Actually, these uh, 
of course, it, it is, or at least should be, the, the role and function of any law to also work in crisis. In, in a way, we could see that law is there for crisis. Law is, you know, not made for just good, good weather days, so it, it should work. But we know, of course, and defined our panel so that let's not talk about cases uh, when international law doesn't work. But I think at least we have to be aware that these cases, you know, also also exist and and you know eric posner and jack goldsmith in, in in their limits of international law they their argument is that international law you know tends to work better in in those good weather days and 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 less so when it uh, when it gets uh, when it gets tough sometimes in crisis i think new international law will be created not just no old international law Applied in the sense, I like uh, Judge Crawford's image, this chance order change that you used for your most recent Hague Academy lecture. Although this chance is, can also sometimes be a very messy affair when you look at the history of international law and see how different periods replace each other. Usually there are major conflicts, wars uh, between them and it, doesn't, it looks ugly for, for some nations at, at least. And uh, so let me also try to insert a specific Baltic uh, perspective to this theme of crisis and, and international law. I, yesterday I asked a very dear fellow board member of European Society of International Law what he associates with, with, with the word of crisis and international law and, and her uh, response was economic crisis. And then it made me think how that probably we do associate different problems or as in, in terms of priority uh, with this concept because I, I imagine that in the Baltic states we would, we would probably mention as the first thing the security issues. I, I happened to read a recent article by the German foreign minister Steinmeier, uh, it was published in Project Syndicate a week ago, he, he writes there, uh, he starts his article by saying European security, to the surprise of many, is under threat once again. So once again, Europe, Europe's security must top our political agenda. He also the co called the Baltics a uh, militarily sensitive region. And uh, that is, of course, this invokes so many so many associations and, and when James says that international law, international legal argument and analysis must take into account the aspect of power, it raises all those, all those interesting questions that our predecessors have argued about for a couple of centuries. For example, is a certain balance of power a sort of so sociological precondition for the successful um, existence of international law? Today's foreign ministers do not use this concept, balance of power, they, but countries like Russia and China, they, they like to talk about multilateralism. Well, for me, multilateralism is a 21, 21st century word for the balance of power. The Baltic experience is, is the experience of small nations existing in the vicinity of, of great powers occasionally having major rivalries and, and, and Tom Frank, whom I miss very dearly, in the 90s wrote that international law has entered its post-ontological era, that we don't need to argue anymore, you know, whether it exists, we know it exists, we only have to discuss how. But then I remember Joseph Weiler's editorial in the European Journal of International Law after the Georgia-Russia war of 2008, or was it after Ukraine, I've already forgotten, that when he said that, well, there isn't perhaps even so much uh, to discuss about this because plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. And then, of course, you could ask, uh, has, has the world really changed compared to when Thucydides uh, wrote his Peloponnesus War um, and, and, and the dialogue, the Melian dialogue between the negotiators of Athens and Melos um, is, is it different now just because we have the prohibition of the use of force in the United Nations Charter of, of 1945? So the historical experience in the Baltic states is, is 
both a so can be so both a source of hope and despair. Despair. So in the interwar periods, James said about his when he was 14. I was 16 when the Soviet Union collapsed, and 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 I think the years preceding that strongly influenced my decision to start to study international law because international law uh, was felt so important at that time. It felt that the relatively bloodless, in Estonia it was bloodless, here in Latvia and in Lithuania it had some, some victims, uh, liberation from, from the Soviet Union, that this was pretty much a victory of, of international, international law. I remember in the 90s when a Western journalist asked Estonia's president, Lennart Meri, what he uh, thinks about India's and Pakistan's uh, nuclear weapon tests. He answered that, that uh, the, the nuclear weapon of small states is international law. Such a thing can only be said by a person who is kind of high from an experience that international law works. But there are other experiences, like during the interwar period, Estonia's foreign minister in 1939 and 1940, when our independence was crushed, was, was a person called Ans, Ans Piep. He also happened to be professor of international law at my university at Tartu at that time. Apparently, it was possible to combine these kinds of jobs. And um, he, he tried for 20 years to build up the relations with, with Soviet Union on international law. Treaties first negotiated, Tartu Peace Treaty of 1920 with Soviet Russia and later on tried to keep Estonia independent when, when World War II broke up. So when he was invited to negotiations in Moscow in the fall 1939, Stalin uh, gave him a photo of himself with dedication to the wise foreign minister of the Estonian people, this and that. And then when he was arrested and sent to Siberian Gulag, then he took this photo with him. So that was his last argument in his life. He died there in 1942. International law didn't work out very well for him. So we have these two, two experiences. You can, be, you can get high on international law. You can get the feeling that international law works out even after 50 years. But you can also uh, die with dictator's photo in your hand. Many thanks, Laurie, and many thanks to Judge Crawford. I would like to shortly draw both of the opening statements together and I think uh, what was very important, um, first of all, Judge Crawford, thank, thank you for reminding us of um, that we might be in a times of crisis, but they have been there before. Um, and uh, for each generation, you said each generation has its crisis and that's surely correct. The important thing, I think, is you stressed language. And um, the question is how international law can frame decision-making by or qua the language it is using. Um, and by that, maybe it does even provide exclusionary reasons for action for the actors in the sense of Joseph Raz. Um, I think the important thing is that international law also provides um, and you, you alluded to it, like procedures um, for resolving crises to go from zero-sum games to possibly positive-sum games. Um, it provides procedures like mediation, conciliation, arbitration, courts. It does provide institutions to do so as well. And I think that connects well to what, what Laurie has said um, and sorry to mention that book again by Goldsmith and Posner, the limits of international law. Um, I think the interesting point in that book is law works differently in different situations. So in different underlying um, problem structures. Um, the problem is that there are many problems with the book, but they leave out institutions um, and I think and the language and the possibility and the the, 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 the possibility of language to frame decisions and the influence of language. Um, now, 
when they use what you call a zero-sum game, um, what they would call a prisoner's dilemma game, um, there are constellations where each actor acts rationally, um, thinking they will be better off, but it leaves all actors, including that very same actor, worse off. So this is a, clearly a constellation which we do not want. So this is not even a zero-sum situation, it's a negative sum situation. And where international law can help here is via reframing not only the perception of the situation, but also by providing the language, the view of the situation, and possibly go from zero to positive sum game. Now again, this is very different in many issue areas of law. So it might be different in security, um, or um, in environmental law or in trade law or economics, um, where clearly the last one is most easy to pass to a positive sum situation and possibly easier than a security situation. Um, still, um, I would like to ask you both, and of course I invite you to comment on each other, but I would like to ask you both where the difference, as you mentioned, James Crawford, um, the, the, the power, we cannot forget about the power structures and the power interests, but we may be able to channel them in a certain way and via international law. International law works at a given moment. If it works at another given moment later on. The problem is we don't know at the first given moment what's going to happen. Um, and we don't know whether our efforts will be successful. We, have a, we bring to situations a certain professional set of professional techniques, the capacity to draft, to write things down and the capacity to learn from what's been written down before. And the capacity, I hope, to be honest about the second of those things. You can trace the decline to the point of virtual collapse of international law during the 1930s by tracking the treaties of alliance that were concluded in the 20s and 30s. And you realise that things were on the way down, notwithstanding the award of Nobel Prizes and for peace and things like that. When you realise that the Locarno Pact only guaranteed the boundaries of Western Europe, not the boundaries of Eastern Europe. And there was, in effect, a prisoner's dilemma in operation because each failure led to a further systemic failure to the point where the whole system was in discredit. So after the failure of the League of Nations under British and French leadership to stop the invasion of Ethiopia or to reverse it, a group of states, including the Scandinavian states, proposed a resolution which in effect amended the covenant in a non-binding way. That is to say, the core of the covenant mechanism was eviscerated because of the reaction to that failure. That was an example of system failure in operation over time, and you can trace it very accurately by looking at the text. But this is but, and this is the interesting but. I've got to use words when I speak to you. And international law of a sort continued to be used. There was continuity of a fashion, even if the outcomes were terrible and people died because of international law. Lots of people died because of international law. I hope not to be one of them, but um, they're, most, they're mostly young. Um, The seminal, uh, uh, the key event in terms of the collapse of international law in the 30s was the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. And there's a wonderful photograph showing Molotov and Ribbentrop at the moment of signature of the pact. 
with Stalin walking up and down b behind with a big smile on his face. We know he, that was acting because he was extremely worried. But the interesting point for us is that the person who's putting the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in front of Ribbentrop, who died for international law, you'd be pleased to know, uh, was the Soviet legal advisor, sorry, the German legal advisor. International lawyers were there for bad as well as for good. And at a certain point, you have to realize that the techniques and the capacities that you have as a result of what is hopefully an increasingly good training in these matters is only half the picture. And the other half is your determination, which does not come from the law, that you will use it in a way which is constructive or which you deem to be constructive as a way out of whatever crisis it is that you happen to have the fortune to own at the time. Yes. Um, well, let me try to make it then a bit more argumentative now. And, and I, I've never been fully convinced by this uh, rhetoric of international lawyers that, yes, we know they, uh, some of the states violate major norms of international law sometimes, but it's a good thing that they all try to use international law as a, as a justification, at least they speak the language of, of international law. I, I'm not sure it's, it's, it's a good thing because I, I didn't study in specific, but I'm sure Hitler too had some international legal arguments and points in 1930s. Now do we say that, well, you know, it's, it, it's, it, was, it was somehow a, a good thing. I think a very, very important part of how to relate to this is actually relates to your current work, James, and that is to how much can we have international adjudication in, in, in things like that. And if you take a historical perspective on international law, this is a very old dream for international law. And in the end of the 19th century, there was this hope and idealism that it will be international adjudication that will then decide, let them all talk the language of international law. And you know, Germany says why it should violate the neutrality of Belgium in 1914, but there's gonna be someone perhaps in the end who who is going to decide? And the reality, of course, is that um, we can see it well from the fact that uh, four out of five permanent members of the UN Security Council haven't um, accepted the, the, the compulsory jurisdiction of the ICJ, and, and the only, only country that has, Britain, has a quite wide uh, reservation, excluding uh, former I mean, Commonwealth members from, from, from suing uh, Britain. So it, is, it tells quite a lot uh, about how much we have adjudication, how much we can have these highly politicized matters of crisis, somehow international lawyers as judges, you know, saying, you know, who did violate and, and who, who not. So uh, looking at it from the small, small state's perspective, perhaps, I found it sometimes disturbing that, that if, if you can, as a major power, to to march in, use force, and, and do it elegantly, using international law as language. Thank you, um, Lowry, and I think it's important to point out that international law m might work differently and is used differently by, depending on who the actor is, um, whether it's a small state, and small states are surely more dependent on international law. This is why we have such a big discussion in Switzerland in the moment, um, and big powerful states, and certainly the P5. I want to take up Laurie's challenge. Uh, I agree with what he says. There's not much point in having very bad international law, and the, the, those of us who try to use it for good are likely to go and do other things like development ec ec economics or become a, measure of the Jesuits, a member of the Jesuit society. Um, and yet, if you, if you go and look carefully and look behind the scenes and not just at the headlines, you see that there is a process going on. It's a serious mistake to identify the process of international law with the process of adjudication. Um, there's very little adjudication of crises in international law. 
Hans Morgenthau, who was trained as an international lawyer, although he subsequently tried to disavow most of that, um, made the point that of the, despite the genu generally valuable work that the Permanent Court of International Justice had done over 20 years, it was the only league organ which was counted as having been generally successful. And it did a number of important things, including establishing a modality of of, of operation of multi-member courts, which didn't exist in international law before that time. Morgenthau made the point that the one case which was clearly a failure in terms of the permanent court was the uh, customs union case. And he said that it's where concatenations of power run completely against the legal rationale for decision making that things break down and of course he worked on the assumption which, with which I agree that, that the actual decision was wrong. But as I say very little of adjudication, very little of resolution of crises is done in terms of adjudication. What adjudicators do is to move in later on and to tidy up the mess. They're a bit like the curators in an assembly hall. Uh, after the assembly is gone, they clean up the mess and get ready for the next performance. We, ha we have to be honest about our role in, the, in those respects. But we also, I think, can conceive the possibility that at least someone is cleaning up the mess. Um, and that these issues remain on the table because inter alia there isn't a, a closure to them in terms of international law. One of international law's strengths, it has many weaknesses, one of its strengths is its capacity to keep issues on agendas for decades. And that was true of the Baltic states. I mean, for all that was wrong, the Baltic states were an unresolved issue at relevant times. For all that was wrong, and I, in my Hague lectures I compared the Merlin dialogue with the position of East Timor under Indonesian rule. Um, about a third, possibly more, of the pre-war Timorese population died during that conflict. The, the death rate was higher than the worst death rate of any country in the Second World War. And yet international law against Indonesia and against Australia, the, the two regionally powerful states, kept that dispute from being closed. It wasn't very much, but it was something. And it was facing something which was for the Timorese themselves an existential crisis. Um, it, whether it was a crisis systemically is another question. Um, and so now we have a situation where Timor-Leste is vigorously suing Australia, almost any forum it can find, and several it can't. Um, I, I express no view at all about the merits of those various actions, except to say that if you want an Attorney General to place his foot in the middle of an international crisis, get him to conduct a security raid the day before your case is due to start. Um, so East Timor-Leste remained on the agenda, became independent, and is re-litigating one of the consequences, of one of the aspects of the dispute which was, had been there all along. And it is an object lesson in the capacity of international law to keep things on agendas, which is a valuable capacity even if it's not the capacity to tell the most powerful entities in the world what they must do, no matter. Um, they'll, they'll be told that in due course or work it out for themselves. And we'll see in the end what the result is. But for the moment, and I say only for the moment, the capacity to be part of a linguistic community which addresses these issues is something. It may not be very much, 
But hell, we haven't been offered very much. Thank you. Laurie? Yeah, we can. Otherwise, I would have, um, we have like 10 minutes left here on the podium before we open up. And um, I might ask you for three wishes which you would have for international law to work better in times of crisis, unless you think it's already um, working very well. Um, something like, I don't know, you could say, you know, better fact-finding missions or w whatever you can think of. It's like in fairy tales. Yeah. And um, maybe would, if some realists, IR theorists would be there, would say that this kind of conversation proves that international law is a utopian discipline because they want to discuss about wishes, how it could be better. I, I think my main wish is that now I sound like populist politician, that international law would work for everyone for whom it is supposed to work. I mean, uh, again, I, I, I am myself, in this sense, influenced by legal positivism. I accept the situation when there is no norm, when states didn't come together, did not say that, let's say, a rich country will give 2% of its GDP, will distribute it to poor countries, and this is a legal oblig obligation. Until that, that didn't, this didn't happen. This is not international law for me. But I, I expect international law to be serious, to work in cases where the, where the state said, for example, when, when, when Russia and Ukraine concluded border treaty in 2003 and both states ratified it in 2004, then such treaties are international law. And, and my hope, so the reason why, why I, I am in this profession is that I still want to believe that uh, in cases like that, treaties like this should be honored. So um, that was just one wish. <laughs> um, would, you, would you wish that the treaty should be effectuated in a different way, a stricter way, more sanctions? I'll, I'll tell one more, one more wish, and this, this has a little bit lengthier explanation what I would have said before. I think when we talk about this today's um, crises in plural, then we inevitably have to have some image of, I think Karl Jaspers had some book on the mental uh, state of the world or something. What, 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 is, what is going on currently? What, what is common to those crises whom, that, we, that we have? And, and in my reading of the history of international law, we had the period of Jus Publicum Europeum, when you know, our predecessors dominated it all and, and we had colonies and, and so on. That lasted at least until the end of World War I. And then uh, during the Cold War, we had a balance of two superpowers divided by, by ideology very much. The question is what, what do we have now in this post-Cold War post 9-11 uh, period. I think it's still, uh, still the question mark and I, I see that international law scholars from, from the generation of uh, Bruno Zima our, our, and, and I believe James as well, for you it has been quite important to say that international law is universal, that this is the major, major project, major effort since 1945. But when I read the ways it is explained how international law is universal, I, I sometimes see doubts to what extent it can be, to what extent it is possible to make international law universal, to make it work in, in different, uh, mm, basically the basis of it would be, would be similar to all, all, all nations and, and regions. And, and I, what I see is, I mean, it's very interesting, it has been very interesting for me when international lawyers talk about fragmentation of international law. There are dozens and dozens of work on the so-called functional fragmentation. We talk about, you know, that international trade is different from human rights and, and, or international environmental law, that they have somehow their own communities and their own courts and who knows what. But there's much less talk about regional fragmentation and, and the fact that, that when you make international law universal, what do you do with the fact that, for example, culturally, uh, 
there might be different concepts of what, what is important. For example, in the U United Nations Charter, to me, the, the, the debate between, let's say, the United States and Russia about the United Nations and international law is also partly a debate about different values, what is read into this, uh, this UN Charter. So your question was, what do I wish? I wish that, uh, that we would not have a complete regional breakdown of, of, of universal international law, that some very basic, most important universal rules will remain the most important ones, even though I see regional international law flourishing. Thank you, Lowry. And James, you have already said you would like to, what international law does is keeping things on the agenda. Um, I think that is one very important thing, and maybe there is something we can do better to keep things on the agenda as well. Um, but I'm sure you have three or more wishes for international law, so. It's very, very difficult to talk about wishes, as Laurie says, without being uh, for, uh, basically cast into fairy tale mode, which is not very comfortable, especially since I've determined to try to be an international lawyer while acknowledging all the bad things there are in the world. Um, which is the opposite of utopian. An easy answer would be I don't have any wishes for international law at all. All my wishes are personal. Uh, I wish that Donald Trump not get elected. <laughs> I wish Brexit hadn't happened. Um, things like that. Um, international law is what happens to you when Donald Trump gets elected or the British leave the European Union, or whatever crisis it might be. Um, uh, that's, just, that's just what we're there for. If everything went well, we wouldn't be needed, except possibly as a subspecies of aviation law, or whatever it might be. Um, so international law is, as I said at the, uh, at the beginning, international law exists because the crises occur. And the crises occur in a way because international law exists, because the um, absence of any constitutional order other than the constitutional order of states in the world is still the dominant fact. If I had a wish, I suppose it would be, I would have, a, have the same wish three times, which might make it a more powerful wish. I have to consult my good fairy as to what, what the rule is about multiple wishes. Um, I wish that we would come at more stable methods of collaboration than, than we have had. And that's one of the reasons, I mean, I'm, I'm not a British, I'm not a UK national and I, didn't, I wasn't entitled to vote in the Brexit referendum. But I, I do regret it because it reduces the options open for the development of new methods of doing international law, even when you say you're not doing international law. And of course, it's this has been the secret of the European Union, which is a regional form of international law, that they're a straight substitute for international law. International bad, European good. Um, I don't entirely adhere to that, but there's some, some point to it. And I think that Brexit is a defeat for that goal, which is a pity. And so my, my wish three times is that we would come at more stable methods of dealing with it. But there may be another way of looking at it. And we, we don't know whether, whether it's right or wrong. Brexit was something that had to happen somewhere. And we'll see just how much multilateralism, internationalism, regional, international law the, the world can stand. The fundamental reason for all of these things is that our allegiances are essentially national. I met a few people who, whose primary allegiance to the European Union, of which they were also nationals. 
but a very high proportion of them were paid large sums of money by the European Union. <laughs> I didn't talk to many ordinary Dutch or British people who thought their main allegiance was to the Union. And that's true more fundamentally about the international system. As international lawyers, we may have an allegiance to international law, but that sort of official allegiance is simply a sine qua non of the system. It's, it's not a particular strength. The strength would be lots of people who are not international lawyers having a primary allegiance to it. And as far as I know, such people do not exist. Uh, people have their primary allegiance to their own state, and the international law is useful in that it helps their own state to address the problems that it has. So we're used to living in a, in a system, as in professional international lawyers, we're used to living in a system in which international law prevails over national law, but national sentiment prevails over international sentiment. And it's that combination of things which gives a peculiar character to international law, which lasts for generations. Because if you read real international lawyers of the 18th century, or even of the 17th century, grappling with problems and not talking about general theory, as they were too prone to do, you'll find that they're dealing with issues which we would be dealing with in much the same way. And so there, there is a continuity of technique, and my wish is effectively that that continuity of technique be put to operation in systems which are politically more stable than the ones we currently have. Thank you, James. Um, I think I might want to add, and following up on you, the wish that there should be some convention which obliges all governments to teach international law in schools, something like that. <laughs> but I would like to open up um, the discussion to the audience now, and I encourage you all to comment and question critically. Um, I'll go from here. You were first. Um, I think there are... Um, yeah, there are people who would give you the microphone. So we have here first, up here in the third row in the middle. And then I have Pierre D'Argent, then Anne Peters, and then there behind. This side is Kama for the moment. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kubo Machak. Uh, I'm a lecturer at the University of Exeter. So. I think uh, both of our speakers have uh, very eloquently convinced us that international law has a role in dealing with situations of crises. But I was wondering if I could turn the question around a little bit uh, for both of them and ask if it's possible or if they are worried that international law as such might be sliding into a crisis of its own. So uh, one of the or some of the developments that have been already mentioned, we have seen the emergence of nationalist rhetoric around the world we have seen uh, the framing of conflict around the world in terms of domestic law rather than in the language of international law. And in many areas of international law, we have seen the retreat from the language of binding rules into the language of rather less binding or even non-binding norms and other more abstract terms. So I wonder if our speakers are worried that this is something that we might be observing at the moment. Thank you. Well, let me start then. I, I think clearly compared to, let's say, the 1990s, there is nowadays more pessimism and reasons for pessimism about the state of, of international law. You have that in, 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 in questions of security with situations like, well, already mentioned. Um, but you also have it like recent accounts, for example, that the protectionism is on the rise, which is probably bad news for WTO in the, in the, in the long run. And now the optimistic view, this Judge Crawford's image change order, chance order change is that, you know, this will inevitably, there's nothing new in it. It will inevitably le lead to some new constellation, perhaps new, new norms that, um, but, but what happens in the, in the, in the, not in the long run, but more in the short run, I think we, we ought to tighten our belts. At least that's, that's how I, I perceive the situation um, living in the Baltic states. Thank you, Lowry. 
I don't re really have much to add. Uh, I agree we should tighten our belts. It's a process which I find increasingly difficult. <laughs> um, international law exists in some basic way and is a predicate of the of a system in which there's no constitutional arrangements between the units of power. Um, but how much of it there should be is a completely contingent question. And there's no rule of international law that says you can't have a reversal of a rule of international law. Things can go backwards as well as forwards. Uh, which is true of trains as well, and it's quite, quite a good design feature in trains or cars. It may be, it may be that it's a necessary design feature in international law as well, that it be able to go backwards. Uh, and keep in reserve the capacity for a new creation, which you saw when international law had reached its um, lowest point in 1940. At the same time, and with increasing determination, those who are looking at the post-war period were trying to work out how much international law the world could afford. And concretely, what should be done to avoid the failures of the League of Nations. Because the United Nations is really a palimpsest upon the covenant, except that unlike all palimpsests, the text of the palimpsest is more obvious than the text of the covenant. But it's back there. Uh, and it's part of what we still have. I suppose uh, I've used through my three wishes, I retract one of my uses. Um, I, th I think the post-1945 settlement, despite the many criticisms of it, was basically a positive settlement. I think it, it illustrated the capacity of the bureaucratic systems of the world to absorb lessons, in particular the lessons of 1919. And I do hope we don't throw it away. We can reduce, as we, as we increase, the scope of the work and influence of the WTO. But the WTO itself was part of the 1945 settlement. The International Criminal Court was part of the 1945 settlement, though long deferred, but it was there. And I'm still a supporter of the International Criminal Court despite all the problems it has had. Because I think there are situations where you have got to get individuals out of circulation in accordance with due process. And I'm not all that, all that in favour of targeted killings. Um, so, it, I hope it's not utopian. It is optimistic. And I agree that with the person who said, be optimistic but tighten your belt, if you can. Thank you, Judge Crawford. Um, Pierre? Thank you very much for this very interesting first panel. Um, uh, Judge Crawford, in your presentation, somehow you said that uh, a problem with current language of international law is that some parts of it uh, do not allow for compromise anymore. And in a way, this suggests that the more international law becomes principled, the less, in a way, it is useful in times of crisis, the less it is relevant in times of crisis. But then, in your comments, you rightly uh, reminded us that international law also serves to keep an item on the political agenda. And I presume this is because, indeed, international law has become principled. Uh, is there a way out for our discipline, a way out of that tension, in a way, international law being the servant of compromises, and international law being somehow, because it is principled, the fuel for crisis. <laughs> international law is principled in the sense that there are certain basic values incorporated which are systemically spread throughout. So the value of sovereign autonomy of states and neo-state entities is spread throughout the law of nationality, for example. It's spread throughout aviation law, actually. 
Um, and that's why international law is a system, not for any grand constitutional purpose, which we might wish to have, but because it's th the way we regulate a decentralized system. Not, not, nothing more nor less than that. And the principles are principles in the sense of Brownlee's principles. The ninth edition of which will be published next year, you'll be pleased to know, in case you want to put it in an advance order. <laughs> they're almost, it sounds contradictory, they're almost descriptive principles. They're almost the principles that you had to have if you're going to have a society of this general character. I always distrust law review articles, and one gets to read a lot of them, which say, articles, quote Article 53 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, on peremptory norms, and then quote a series of statements by various people, often exercising functions which did not call for pronouncement on peremptory norms talking about peremptory norms, and then saying, therefore, it follows that some rather absurd conclusion must be. International law doesn't work that way, not even the international law of peremptory norms. Uh, and if you want to make it work that way, you, you will be living in a, in a world of your own, a coherent world, <laughs> a happy world because you get on with all the other participants in that world but not one that bears much relationship to reality. My 18-month-old son has his own language. It's quite an elaborate language. It's, it's basically a tonal language, I think. We were recently in South Africa, and he's added some clicks to it. It's a wonderful language, except no one else speaks it. And we don't want to, be, we don't want to have an international law that no one else speaks. There are enough problems already. Thank you. Um, Anne Peters? Could, could you, sorry, I forgot that. Could you, everybody, introduce yourself quickly before you? Okay, Anne Peters, Max Planck Institute, Heidelberg. Uh, coming from the interest group on the history of international law, yesterday I would like to hook on to the historical remarks which have been made, not in order to look for lessons from history or so, but to see uh, whether we could imagine alternative futures and also see how past struggles and crises have still an impact on nowadays. And I think, as also Lauri and James mentioned, that the period of which I am reminded now to be in resembles most uh, after the interwar period at the, at the out brink of the Second World War, not because of the cyber war and war on terror rhetoric, but because of the disillusion, disenchantment and disillusionation. <laughs> Uh, with the power of international law, the optimism, the hype uh, which we had in the 1990s where in fact so many new institutions had been built and also where scholarship, including my own scholarship, was very optimistic and James and both James and Laurie said, well, this was maybe naive or it's dangerous to be utopian. Utopian is, uh, is a bad thing. And that's exactly what had been said uh, after the interwar period about all these idiots of Geneva, the Schuckings and Webergs and Politis and so on who, who uh, pretended that international law could really build a new world. And, world. and I now looked uh, into the, again, into the book uh, by Edward Carr, uh, which has the title 20 Year Crisis. Uh, so a 20 years crisis and I was astonished to read that Although he, he very much disparages and uh, makes fun out of these idiots of Geneva and their utopianism, which was uh, uh, totally naive, he thinks, and he now suggests a real scientific approach to international relations. So it's the first and I think really best manifest of realism in that book, much better than Schwarzenberger and so on. And he, in the end, he emphasizes the role of the economic system the necessity of redistribution, also transboundary redistribution. And he says that we have to uh, draw lessons from the struggle of the classes, from the economic deprivation inside states, and accept that we have to 
ta tackle that also on the international realm. And in our times, with the Gini coefficient or the Palma index or what being as high as ever and the, the, the cleavage between the rich states and the poor states and the state states being, becoming bigger than ever, I think that this is an astonishing uh, astonishing repetition of periods of naive, naivete plus economic problems and I think the economic side of the crisis in which we are in has not yet been mentioned so much by you too uh, and that's maybe a very important root cause uh, which international law has to tackle in a more in a different way than we've been doing it in the last 20 years. Um, I'm tempted to just say one thing um, because I've just looked at it. The inequality between states, the state as a whole, is going down. There are states where the Gini coefficient within the states is going up. Nevertheless, and I think that is one success, maybe of international law, maybe of something else, um, the amount, and we all know the progress reports from the Millennium Development Goals, the, people, the number of people living in absolute poverty has fallen a lot due to China, due to India. So I think, um, yeah, but I, I'm the moderator here. I'm not supposed to answer anything. James or Laurie? Laurie first? Well, um, I think every winner of a world situation tries to, this is in the nature of human beings, tries to kind of impose his or her values and, and in a way imagine that these values are or must be universal values and I think therefore when the Cold War ended you saw a rise I mentioned Tom Frank before his, his writings the right to democracy James has written about these things I think what we miss sometimes was perhaps the question to what extent these these this is a I don't know Western perspective the Western world emphasizes the individual these are her rights, uh, therefore democracy, therefore self-determination, these things. Uh, and therefore, coming back to this uh, James thesis that international law has become somehow rigid in, in its uh, main um, principles, I, what I see is almost worse that indeed different, different powers emphasize different principles. So if you, if you examine more closely Russian and Chinese grievances, about international law, then the main point there is that why, why have you guys stopped talking about the main thing in international law since centuries, which is state sovereignty? Why do you talk always about all these other things, but not about the main thing of international law, which is state sovereignty? And, and I think that the call, if you want to avoid the conflict in the, in, the, in the future, we have to continue this conversation, which for me is partly an inter-civilizational uh, discourse. Uh, what what does state, what will state sovereignty mean in the 21st century? And I, I, I think um, when with what Anne Peters has said, you know, the question of sovereignty and also subsidiarity in the international law, and on on what types of issue areas would we say, well, we leave it to sovereignty, but we do enable states to do something because this is a print or a norm of international law, which is basically codified as well in the covenant, um, to, to help there, and how far and how should international law do this? I too was influenced by E.H. Kao's work. He's basically a historian of Russia. Uh, and the 20 years crisis was uh, a polemic. Uh, if you look at, look at the world now, there are about 200 functioning entities, more or less functioning, at, at the state level. In E.H. Carr's time, there were less than 50. And they're mostly Western. And they had very large empires which have all broken, or very largely broken down. And I, I have to say, I think the situation we're in in 2016 is better than the situation that E.H. Carr envisaged that we would be in. And I... I think that international law is part of the functioning of that system. There are economic problems, but they've been grossly exaggerated. There's a rise in protectionism, but the rise and fall of protectionism is a long-term process, uh, uninfluenced very largely by law. Um, and then there are the problems we all know about uh, radicalism, terrorism, 
large-scale migration. The, pro the problems are being addressed. And if you ask whether they're being addressed by extra legal means, some of them are. If you ask whether you like the way they're being addressed, some, some of us don't. But international law is an arsenal of devices for dealing with situations. Um, and one of the situations it deals with, of course, is the peremptory abolition of slavery and abolition of interstate conflict. Of course there will always be interstate conflict, but there's a lot less interstate conflict than there used to be. And most of the victims of war in the last 50 years have been the victims of civil war by far. When international war for, uh, breaks out, there are usually pressures to contain it, emanating from the Security Council and elsewhere. It's much more difficult, we, we find, to contain civil war. And that's precisely because we lack the various devices that international law uses to contain the conflicts with which it's primarily concerned. Thank you very much, Judge Crawford. Um, we are five minutes behind time. I have one more question, but I think, Inita, um, okay, that's what I thought. I, um, so I'm very sorry, we have to stop here, and I would like to invite you to thank um, both of our pre panelists here for, I think, what's a lively discussion and opened up a lot of questions, maybe some of them answered or partially answered, but we still have a whole conference to work on those topics and those questions. So let me thank them for this wonderful speech.